Our second reading also comes from the Apostle. We'll be reading the opening verses of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. This may be a familiar reading to you, so listen with care. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. You know, love... Love is what makes life human. It's also what makes life holy. Our lives are defined by love. You know, we, we accomplish things in life, and our accomplishments matter. We, we build things and contribute to the world, and that's important. We, we move the needle in our own small ways and change things we hope for the better. And that matters. But at the end of the day and at the end of our days, what matters most is love. Our lives are ultimately defined by, by who we love and how we love them. It was theologian James K.A. Smith. He said that worship, what we do here, is worship curates our hearts. It trains our hearts to love the right things and to love in the right way. We are what we love. And the experience of loving can be glorious and unsettling and risky and unnerving. It can be all-consuming. This is why love is the currency of poets and songwriters, of novelists and playwrights. It's also biblical. Song of Solomon, a book that's not read in church every week, is a book of love poetry. Just a, just a sample. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet. I should, I should stop. I should stop. When we experience love, like the Song of Solomon declares, it can be overpowering. Our heart is on our sleeve. Our thoughts are all consumed. The smallest gesture or facial expression can pull the rug out from under us, turn our insides to jelly. Love can, can completely put us out of control. The Song of Solomon gets that. Paul, on the other hand, not so sure. No one ever accused Paul of being romantic. When Paul speaks of love, he said, well, love is mostly labor. So just a tip. If, if you're at a romantic dinner with your beloved and you're asked, what do you think of our love? If you respond, well, you know, as the scripture says, 
it's a lot of work. You might not have to spring for another romantic dinner. That might, that might be your last. I'm just saying maybe we don't turn to the apostle for guidance in all things. Paul says, I thank God for your labor of love. Now, of course, you know what he's talking about with that as well. Because when Paul speaks of love, he's not speaking of what we feel. He's talking about how we treat one another. You remember what we talked about last week? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking for show of hands, believe me. No, last week we said that faith is work because faith is not limited to what we think. It shows up in our choices. If I understand the text, Paul understands love in the same fashion. He says love is labor because love is not limited to what we feel. It shows up in how we treat one another. It's that kind of love. In Paul's most detailed description of love, he says love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude. Now, that description may sound like he's talking about feelings, but it's, it's different than that. Patience is less something we feel. It's more something we choose. And the irony is we need to choose patience when what we're probably feeling is what? Impatience. Kindness. It's not something we feel, it's something we choose, and we're aware of it the most when we choose it in the face of a display of lack of kindness. That's why it's a labor. That's why it's work. As Clint Black sang, love isn't someplace that we fall, it's something that we do. John Meacham wrote a inspiring biography of John Lewis called His Truth is Marching On, and in that biography, Lewis describes this labor of love. He says it this way. He says, it's, it's not love of one individual for another, not loving something that is lovely to you. It is a love, it is a love that accepts and embraces the hateful and the hurtful. It is a love that recognizes the spark of the divine in each of us, even those we might call our enemy. To love like that is work. And that is not a love that we develop on our own. It's a love that comes as a gift from God. It's interesting. When Paul gives thanks, he doesn't give thanks to the Thessalonians for their love. Actually, nowhere is thanks offered from one, in Scripture, nowhere is thanks offered from one person to another person. Thanks is always offered to God. He gives thanks to God for the love that is practiced in Thessalonica because he recognizes that it is a holy gift. But saying it as a gift doesn't allow us to sentimentalize it. It's, it still becomes a labor for us because this love endeavors to recognize the image of God in our neighbors and all of them, even when it is difficult to see. But you know that. Paul doesn't know you, but I think if the apostle were here today and were preaching to you, he would probably offer the same prayer. I thank God for your village church, for your labor of love, because it shows up. One of the ways, not all the way, one of the ways, an example of the way that the labor of love shows up in us is our mission. I say that because Mission really needs to be understood. It's, it's bigger than service. We're not just providing a program or an experience. And mission is bigger than charity because 
Charity is often motivated about the feelings it generates among the charitable. Now, mission is in the church a labor of love, an act of love. Today, we're giving thanks to God for signature mission. It has a history with us here at Village. Every, every year, you reach out and, and partner with some ministry or mission in our community and make a difference to change people's lives. You have, you have before stood with Rosebrook's Domestic Violence Shelter, providing safety for women and children whose home life was defined by violence or fear. Fear is a horrible place to live. You supported the Upper Room Reading Program, which provided school tutoring for a whole class of children. When Reconciliation Services was trying to imagine into reality Thelma's Kitchen, you were a lead gift to help make that a reality. That's just a few ways. This is what the labor of love looks like. This year, our committee was inspired and drawn to Car Wu and the work he does with our homeless neighbors. He is moved by compassion for those with the greatest need to provide shelter, yes, transportation, yes, health care services, yes, access to dreams, yes, but mostly it's just dignity, respect. It's seeing the image of God in our neighbors who most people don't see at all. And it's important and good that you have partnered with them in this ministry because there actually is no theological justification for citizens of this nation to be on the streets. Visiting with Carr has, when we visited a few months ago, made me aware that I really don't have anything in my experience to tap into that would allow me to imagine what is it like to have no place to go, no home to go to. What is that like? I, I don't have any antecedent in that. But I, I did remember this when I, when I was in high school, I got, I got a go job selling shoes at a mall about a half a mile from my house. It, it was, I, I think it's fair to say that I was the worst shoe salesman in the history of footwear. And so when, when my manager got his first opportunity, he transferred me to another store. It was about 30 minutes away at another mall around the other side of Atlanta. And, one afternoon after work, I was driving home on 285, the perimeter interstate around Atlanta. I was driving home. It was, it was raining. The streets were wet. And, and in the confession that my mother is just finding out about right now, I was driving too fast for those conditions. It was stupid of me, really. And so when the cars in front of me locked up, I couldn't stop. I hit my brakes. But then like I was in a slow motion movie. I don't know if you've had this experience. It felt like I was in a slow motion movie. I watched my car slide into the cars ahead of me. I watched the hood of my car crumple up. No one was hurt, but I totaled my car. Then I called my mom and she came and picked me up and I think within a week I had another car. It too was used. It was a Ford Granada with about a billion miles on it. The only good thing about that car is it improved my prayer life because I never knew if it was going to start or not. But here's the point. On an ordinary November afternoon, I had an experience or made a decision that resulted in a circumstance that I couldn't fix. I had a job, but I didn't have enough money to buy another car. And if I couldn't buy another car, I couldn't keep my job. Things spiral like that. Now for me, I had a safety net. 
my parents were able to take care of what I could not take care of. Many of you have that safety net. Many of you have been that safety net. But for many of our neighbors, that net's not there. For many of our neighbors, they hit a situation of bad luck or maybe they make a stupid decision. Or there's, there's mental health issues or addiction realities and they find themselves in a situation they can't fix and it spirals and they end up on the street. I'm not gonna make it without help. And Carl Wu and his mission saw that reality and sought to be the change that he saw the world needed. And it's good that we're partnering with that. I, I, I told you recently about my encounter with a homeless guy, Gabriel. He, you may remember, I'm not asking. He, he lived in the park across the street from the church I served in Florida. What I remember about Gabriel is that he loved the music of John Rutter. He, he went to college until his mother got sick, and then the money that the family were paying for tuition had to go pay for doctors, and then the money ran out and it spiraled, and Gabriel ended up living in the park across the street. Because, because Christian DNA is to love, it means that it's holy to treat our neighbor like they're human. To minister to those on the street is holy work. There really is no theological justification for citizens of this nation to be on the streets. But our mission is more than service. We're not just offering a program. It's more than charity because charity so often is motivated by how good it fe makes the charitable field. No, our mission is a work of love. And this is, this is maybe a growing edge for us, an opportunity for us here to, to broaden and to expand on what is already here because if, if our mission is a labor of love, then at the end of the day, it doesn't provide a program, it becomes relational. For mission to be a labor of love, it has to be a relational. We, it is good that we invest our resources in mission around this city. That may actually be more important for us to do to give than it is for those that we support. But where our mission is most truly a labor of love, it means we learn some names. It means we know some stories. It means we give time to people whose life is so different from us that we develop the imagination of what it is to go through the day without a net. Several years ago, I went with a number of you to Thawake, Kenya, and it was a remarkable experience. I met Rachel there. She's Kenyan. She's a nurse. She's about three feet tall and ball of energy. She, she took a leave from her nursing job in the time that we were there, and she would get up in the morning before sunrise and warm water over the fire pit so that us Americans could have what we're accustomed to, a shower with warm water. And when the water was warm, she'd bring it to us and then go back and she would cook our morning meal, which was delicious and abundant. When the dishes were clean, she would join us at the healthcare clinic where we were serving and without ever pointing out that we didn't know what we were doing, she would help us do it better. She would leave a little early in the afternoon to return to the cookhouse to cook our evening meal. She cooked for about 35 of us on an open fire every day. And I said to her, I said, Rachel, you are taking amazing care of us. You are working so hard. You've got to be exhausted. You are treating us like royalty, I said. That's what I said. You're treating us like royalty. She looked at me, and I might have offended her. It was not my intent, but I might have. She said, no, Pastor, we're treating you like family. We're treating you like we belong to one another. 
Rachel, as much as anyone I know, understands Paul's teaching. She knows the work, the labor that is generated by love. You do too. For as a community, we share our financial support with missions around this city. We do it every year. But we also share time. We learn names. We learn stories. We begin to develop the imagination of what it is to live in this culture in so many circumstances without a net. And that's a labor of love. To love like that is the church's DNA. We do not sentimental, sentimentalize it. It's work. It's labor. It's labor because it's not love of one individual for another. It's not loving something that is lovely to us. It is a love that is generated by knowing the spark of the divine, the image of God rests in each of us, even in those who others do not see at all. And that kind of love redeems the world. You may not think so, but Jesus bet his life on it. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.